Good morning. Good morning. I think we ought to open up our lesson this morning with prayer. And let's say a special prayer for Tim today. He's not having a very good day today. Let's pray that the Lord, in agreement, that the Lord would work a miracle in Tim. And that the brain waves would be perfect, accurate. And that God could touch him with healing, complete and total healing. And we pray that God is with and comfort Tim's family, his immediate family, and Brother J.R. and his family. And we know we serve a God who is a God of healing. And he's the only one that can do the healing. So, Lord, we lift him up to you right now, Lord, that God, that you would touch, touch him, Lord, and God, that he would have full use of every member of his body. And, Lord, we thank you this morning that we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and to set and open up your word, Lord, and, Father, just try to relay what you're trying to say to us in this book of Revelation, Lord. God, we might not get it all right, but, Father, we're going to know what, what the book of Revelation is about. And it's about the second coming of your Son, Lord. Father, to make all wrongs right. And, Lord, as we get to the end of this book, Father, we look for the blessing that you told us that we would receive, Father, if we would read and hear and keep those things which are written therein. So, Father, we're looking for the blessing. And, Lord, once again, we thank you for this privilege that we can come together in safety and worship your precious name. Lord, we lift up all the names that we heard today, Father, who are hurting, who has many needs, Lord. And God, we need a touch of healing for each and every one. Father, we ask these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Today we're going to finish up with the great harlot that we studied last week. And we're going to move on to the bride of Christ, which is in the next, the next chapter. This is where we bottom out in our study. We have been in that deep, depressing valley since chapter 6, when the Lamb started to break open the seven seal. And we know behind each seal there was a judgment. And as each judgment come, one was a little bit worse than the other. And at the end of the seventh seal, there were seven more judgments waiting upon the earth. And also in that seventh seal, not only was there seven more trumpet judgment, they were seven more bold judgments. And we have looked at all the judgments, all the wrath of God. Now what we're going to be studying today, ever how far we get, is we're going to look at Babylon. Last week we looked at the mystery Babylon. That was the religious part. Today we're going to look at the political or economic or the commercial part of the Antichrist's kingdom. At the rapture of the church, immediately the Antichrist will come upon the scene. And the Bible tells us with all lying wonders and signs and deceivement, he will deceive all the nations. The nations will think that he is the Messiah because this guy, the Bible says, speak great words and blasphemies. In the first three and a half years, he will be gaining power 
any way he can. He knows the only way that he can be a world leader is to have all the world religions to come under one roof. He has a cohort, the false prophet, who will spearhead a movement that will bring all religions under one roof. Now, the Antichrist uh, Christ's empire will be in two parts. They will be a one-world government headed by him, and they will be a one-world religion. That at first, for the first three and a half years, it will be uh, run by the Antichrist. During that three and a half years, the religious part of his empire, the false churches, the church will become rich beyond comprehension. There's no way to estimate how wealthy and rich that the church will become. And the Antichrist will use the, the church to his own benefit. And when he's tired of her, he will get rid of her like we studied last week. His empire will consist of ten nations. The old Roman Empire revised will be his empire. The ten kingdoms, as we studied last week, when he's tired of the great harlot, the church, these ten kingdoms will give him their power and they will destroy the great heart, the church. Because at this time, the Antichrist will go into the temple and claim himself to be God Almighty. He no longer needs the church. He's used her, and now he's going to abuse her. And we've seen how the kings of the earth last week destroyed the church burn her, eat her flesh. But today what we're going to see where the kings last week destroyed the church, what we're going to study today is where God will destroy the Antichrist and his kingdom. The political and commercial and economic part of his empire. But he has still got the church because he himself has claimed that he is the church now. And as we look at what we're going to study today, we're going to study Babylon. And to understand Babylon, we have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapters 10 and 11, to find out just what we're talking about, this Babylon. The old ancient Babylon that was built on the Euphrates River will be rebuilt. Now the scholars, they're divided in this. Some say that it never will be rebuilt, but some scholars say it will be rebuilt. I believe it will be rebuilt. Babylon is mentioned, mentioned more in the Bible than any other city except Jerusalem. And then, like I said, it goes all the way back to the days of Noah and the flood. After the flood, God told Noah's three sons and three uh, their wives to go and replenish the earth and to scatter, to populate the whole earth. Noah's grandson, Cush, had a son named Nimrod, whose very name means rebel or revolt against God. Nimrod didn't listen to God, what God said. He built a city named Babel. That's where we get the word Babylon. He built the city Babel. 
Also the Tower of Babel. We're all familiar with that. He was the first type of Antichrist, was Nimrod. He was the first to have a one-world government and a one-world religion. Now, Babylon, some believe that will never be built again, but some scriptures point to it that it will in the end days that the Antichrist will have his seat and his throne there where it's going to be a rebuilt Babylon. It would be in the same place where Nebuchadnezzar had his throne and who was the king of Babylon. Now some say that the Antichrist, his last three and a half years, that's where his throne will be. He has moved it from Rome over to ancient Babylon. Some say he won't have enough time to rebuild Babylon to make it a global commercial city. But they're underestimating God. Because right before the Persian Gulf War, Saddam Hussein for 25 years has been rebuilding Babylon because Nebuchadnezzar was his mentor, was his hero. He even went as far as having money minted with his picture and Babylon on the other side. So if God, in in last chapter, where we see where God put it in the minds of these kings to give their power and authority to the Antichrist to destroy the church, God might have just told, put it in the mind of Saddam Hussein for 25 years to start to rebuild the city of Babylon. So when the Antichrist comes, it probably will be already half built. And he can move right in there. But Babylon is very great in time. Babylon is great in sin. And Babylon is great in prophecy. She will play a big part in the end times economically, religiously, and in prophecy. Have you ever (coughs) read the paper and you don't know what you're reading, if you're reading good news or bad news? I heard of a woman who said to her friend, I got married. Her friend said, that's good. Said, but he's very mean to me. Said, oh, that's, that's bad. Said, but he's very rich. She said, that's very good. But he's very stingy. Oh, she said, that's, that's really bad. But he bought me a new house. Oh, honey, that's, that's, that's really good. But it burned down. She said, oh, that's, that's really bad. But he was in it. <laughs> so sometimes when we read the newspapers, we don't know whether the news is good or bad. Sometimes we look at the newspaper and we say, oh, what terrible, terrible news. But when we put the newspaper in one hand, and the word of God in the other hand. And we see how everything is fitting into the sockets of prophecy. Then we see that everything that might seem like bad news may not be bad news at all. Because I believe 
that we are in the end times. And I believe that we are so close. As one guy said, he said, we are so close to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the rapture that you can hear the tinkling of the silverware as the angels set the table for the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's pretty close. So what we want to look at today will be the old ancient Babylon on the Euphrates River being rebuilt. We're going to see the judgment of her. Just like the, the song we sung this morning about, Father, remember your promises. Well, God has made a promise to his people and to us that all the heartaches that we have been through and all the heartaches that his people has been through for the year, someday he was going to make that right. And when he judges this ancient Babylon, those promises have come true. And I want you to think of this Babylon that we're talking about today is not a system like the church was last week. This is a literal city that will be rebuilt. And it says in verse 1, I don't know how far we'll get today, but we'll go as far as we can. If you'll turn your Bible to chapter 18, verse 1, we'll read a few verses, and then we'll back up and see how far we can get. Remember, this is going to be the judgment of the ancient Babylon. And just like the song, the last song we sang, God is going to the enemy's camp and he's going to take back what he stole from Adam. Chapter 18, verse 1. John said, after these things, when you hear that, you say, after what things? After what we just got done studying. And that was the destruction of the religious mystery Babylon. After these things, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Now listen to this voice. And another voice came from heaven. saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her as she rendered to you. <clears throat> Repay her double according to, the, to, according to her works in the cup which she has mixed. Mixed double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived in luxury. In the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. 
For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will see no sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death, mourning, and famine. And she will utterly be burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived in luxury with her will weep and mourn when they see the smoke of her burning. And standing at a distance, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour her judgment has come. This is the judgment that God has promised that any nation that would hurt his people that they would have to repay. Now when John said, after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven. This angel had great authority. And he said, and the earth just by this angel's presence, lit up the whole earth. You know, when we get to heaven, we're going to see just how important angels was in our lives, of watching over us, keeping this world safe. And he said that this angel cried with a mighty voice, saying that Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. That is a double fall. That is the fall, one fall that we studied last week of the religious part. And now we're talking about Babylon the Great, this ancient Babylon, that will fall. This is all future. This is all future. When Shanachariv, many, many centuries ago, the Assyrian king, he destroyed this ancient Babylon. He even dug up its foundations. But Ezra had his successor, Assyrian king, rebuilt this ancient Babylon. And it does say, and six chapters in the Bible speak solely of the destruction of Babylon. You need to read these six chapters. Isaiah 13 and 14. Jeremiah 51 and 52. And Revelation 17 and 18. They talk solely of the destruction of Babylon that is coming. Now, when Ezra hadn't rebuilt it, the prophecy of the destruction was after he built it. So this ancient Babylon has never been destroyed in such a manner that nothing will ever live on it again. It will be the home of demons and jackals and dragons, and water will come up and cover it. Ancient Babylon has never experienced that kind of judgment. So this must be in the future. And that's what we're looking at today, the rebuilding of this ancient Babylon. And he goes on to tell us uh, why he is going to de destroy this ancient Babylon. He said, for all the nations have drank of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All the nation has been intoxicated by the things that this world puts, puts before us. And it's many intoxicants. It could be alcohol, it could be pleasure, it could be wealth, it could be sex. Those are the things that the world sets before us like bait. 
to try to turn us, to try to distract us from the spiritual things. And the Bible says, don't get carried away with the cares and the riches of this world. Don't fall for that. And this wine has been bottled many, many thousands of years ago. And people are still getting drunk on the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth, he says, have committed fornication with her. She has dulled the, the, the mind and the views of the rulers of the earth. They have bought into this, that they have to have this pleasure, that pleasure. And even the merchants of the earth, they have bought into this system, this satanic system that opposes everything that God ever stood for. We're going to find out there's about five groups of people who will weep and mourn and lament and wail because this city is being destroyed. The kings of the earth, number one, the rulers of the earth, who have slept with her, who have fornicated with her, they will be weeping and wailing. The merchants who have become rich, they will weep and wail when they see the destruction of her. And over in the other verses, we'll see who the rest of them are. But now we hear a voice, a different voice, a voice from heaven. This is God himself. Speaking to all the people who are in her, follow her. Also, this is a message to us. All through the Old Testament and the New Testament, God has a warning. Come out of her, my people. This is his last plea before the wedding supper of the Lamb next week. This is an everlasting plea that he said from day one. Come out of her, my children, and be separate. Don't fall for the things that she puts in front of us, the bait that she puts in front of us. Don't fall for that. God is making a plea to us and to the people that will live in Babylon. And it would be his people because just like in Sodom and Gomorrah, he had people in Sodom and Gomorrah and he told them to come out of her. He will have believers. He's not talking about unbelievers to come out of the world. Because if the unbelievers would come out of the world, then there would be no world left. He's talking about believers, his children, his people. Come out of her and be separate. And you know, sometimes we have a problem with that, of being separate. We say, oh, here we go again. We got to be, we got to be separate. We got to be separate. I can't do this. I can't do that. What are we giving up to follow Jesus? What are we giving up when we turn 40, 50, 60? Our body is falling apart. Our fashion it's out of fashion. <laughs> what are we giving up? You know, the key to separation is not being separated from. 
but it's to be separated unto. What he is calling us is to a relationship unto himself. You see, we have a different calling from the world. We have a different destination. We have a different citizenship. We're not of the world. We have to come out of the world. You hear so much today about church and state. We better be wearing about church and world. Because the church is mingling too much with the world. We've had our final plea. Come out of her, my children. Why? For her sins. Her sins, God says, have reached to heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. Now that little phrase there, reached to heaven, in the Greek it is that they were piled up. They were piled up like a tower, glued together, stacked up like a tower. I think that's throwing in the face of the Tower of Babel. But her sins over the years have been piled up, glued up, stacked together, and now they're reaching the nostrils of God. And it says God has remembered her iniquities. You know, the Bible tells us that God has remembered our sins and iniquities no more. But he remembers this battle. He remembers every single sin that they did against his people. Then he goes on to tell us in verse 6, some of the plagues that he's going to put on her. He said, render to her. Your translation might say reward, same thing. Render to her just as she rendered to you. In other words, you treat her the way she treated you. Only repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her. Whatever damage, destruction that this Babylon ancient city has done over the years, and she has did plenty, God said to render to her the same thing. Only what she gave you give her double. You see, when God makes a promise, God will keep that promise. And now we're going to see her, her flatness, her pride. It said, in the same, in the measure that she glorified herself, how wonderful she is, and lived in luxury. In the same manner that she glorified herself, you give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will see no sorrow. Do you ever notice? How brazen and how bold Satan is getting these days. The sin that used to slink down back alleys now struck down Main Street. He is getting so brazen, so bold. And you know why he's so bold and so brazen? He thinks he's got everything that the world has to offer, and he does. He does. He's got all of the wealth that the church 
when he destroyed the church, he's got all of that wealth that the church had. And we see in chapter 17 that she was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls and silver, all of the world's wealth this church had. He's now got that. He's got the fine linen, the silk, and the scarlet. He's got everything that a man could want. And now he thinks he's sitting as a queen that nobody can ever take that away from him. He misunderstands and underestimates the power of God. And he said, I sit as a queen and am no widow. We know that God had made provisions for the widows that people would take care of. But what she is saying, I don't need nobody, nobody's help. And nobody is going to do anything to me. I will see no sorrow. This is what he is flaunting in the face of God Almighty. Remember this. Satan sells a sinking ship. And if you're one of those people that won't come out of Babylon, if you're one of those people that's riding that ship, Brother, sister, you're going down. You're going down. Come out of her, my children. Now he says, after he flaunts himself, struts down Main Street, pumps his chest out full of pride, here's what God says, therefore. You never want to hear God say therefore. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day. Death, mourning, and famine. That's quite a bit. That's quite a load in one day. And she will utterly be burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. You see, this judgment that's coming up on this Babylon, this ancient Babylon, in the future, it's not happening after the bold judgments. It's happening during the bold judgments. If we can go back to chapter 16, you don't have to do it, but save time, I'll tell you what it says. If we can go back to chapter 16, verse 17, that said, And the angel poured out his bowl, the seventh bowl, seventh and final, poured out his bowl into the air, the atmosphere. And a loud voice came from the temple of heaven, from his throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake since men had not occurred since men was on the earth. And the great city was split, divided into three parts. And here it is. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And then it goes on to say that all the cities sank, fell, and every island sank, and the mountains were not found. This is the judgment that these people will face. They will narrowly escape. Anytime an earthquake, we always have an intense burning. And that's what it's saying right here, that this Babylon will be burnt with intense heat. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19, I believe it says, that the judgment of Babylon will be as Sodom and Gomorrah. 
intense burning, total and complete destruction. And let's look at some of the people who has bought into her, the kings of the earth who committed fornications with her. Okay, we got to end right there for today. But we'll uh, finish this next week. We still got a lot, a lot to uh, pick up uh, next week. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the short version that we had this morning. But Lord, we just thank you for the privilege that we're allowed to lay it out here, Father. And Lord, if there's anybody that sits in this class, Lord, that is still in Babylon, Lord, and hadn't come out yet, Father, we just ask you that you would uh, pierce their heart, Lord, with your word. And, Father, that they could come forward. And, Lord, once again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for a wonderful lesson that he has given us this morning. And now, Father, be with us as we go through the day. Lord, be our eyes and be our ears, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.